All right, Danny Nash, thank you so much for uh, for being here. It's nice to meet you. You too. Thanks for having me. No, absolutely. I I was very excited to to chat with you because when I I heard your new singles, uh, I'm a, a sucker Hello, folks. for a really good Between Awesome and Disaster. Head. This is your host, oh, yeah. Will Carey. I appreciate you tuning in, and and I hope uh, you are having a good like start to your summer. Like, Hope luscious, you had a good uh, Memorial Day. It just really felt I like hope I was that there floating is through like rela- uh, rest and relaxation uh, on your of front, dreams. and that uh, oh. you're able to clear your mind <laughs> that sounds, uh, yeah, somewhat, that's exactly even if it is for <laughs> brief moments at a time. I think that's uh, vitally important. Do you I, for remember one, uh, when uh, like the consumed uh, ethos, you originally came up with in, the idea for that song? What was episodes, the first thing that um, came to you when consumed you were with uh, uh, several big uh, home repair um, projects? Well, it was uh, a collaboration where, between me and um, live, my friend Peter uh, Elkis, so who is the producer and engineer done, for those for my uh, music. I will um, feel as of late. a immense and, uh, sense. He of brought me this because when you have something that like synth bass melody, wanting to get done for a long time and I obstacle just after obstacle kind of just uh, started writing the continues lyrics. to present itself and, um, the, rele- the relief that I crave together it's me after, writing the lyrics uh, and the melodies the build up, and sort of giving uh, me like little bits immense. and pieces of a song so and I'll just kind of like I, I literally have been trying to, to get like a um, part so of, it's pretty of collaborative my, that way. my shower fixed uh, for but almost a year I was just kind of and thinking I about continue to run into obstacles you know relationships uh, I've had with and parts and trying um, to learn figure out situations things situations where that you I just do not know that continue to be put back on, it on work out, uh, but to me it's like whereas I feel like if I'm everyone goes through the same process of for me and I'm expecting and a bit more but that's kind of go up where and I'm down at, that's where I'm at uh, emotionally right now expected uh, or, really looking forward to you know. and visualizing uh Completed I do. There's a real sense of the, uh, the sense of, kind of wistful I don't have to think about that from listening to the anymore. lyrics. That that's what uh, I'm craving I certainly, right now. This is like very boring, of very boring like times uh, middle-aged in adult sort of stuff. Because like it is very, very real. Longing for like, like what your expectations to be met. In, in and a sense, like uh, doesn't quite. Do I feel that. like I probably like so disappointing. Looked at these minor accomplishments, but then you know. Uh, and when certainly I wrote my dad it, I realized projects he would do around the house that that wasn't even what I wanted to begin with and not understanding. So it was more, the song was a bit of a like, so why it's so important, why it gets so feel. wrapped up in like finishing like little things, but it's feeling. because it's a weight. It's a, it's a, a it's a yeah, line on a checklist in your I head find a, a that very runs constantly, constantly to write in, and until into that music, checkmark goes away, I've your vision is clouded do by, uh, lately by that checkmark. coming out of like, so I understand the early uh, just a little bit, like, uh, pop a little bit explosion, more which was uh, really than I used to got me into uh, music. So it's 38 year old, of, like you uh, suck. Can, uh, no personal growth. <laughs> can kind empathize of, a little bit in the world yeah. sort of songs on the show today. Um, uh, musician, uh, Danny Nash, Danny, is now hitting those more. Uh, a Toronto-based uh, uh, drummer and stages. singer so and songwriter. I, I there's uh, a, that she just like really put out two uh, really cool songs. From uh, one is called "Ordinary um, Love," the other is called maybe, "Anything um, at All." Those two songs are, your are available everywhere you get your music. Of, if you enjoy those, you should go back really and listen to her full-length album that she put out back in 2021. But uh, I, think that we Dan, I became aware of these first two songs, which are uh, a little different from um, the kind of songs that we uh, and musicians that I cover on this show. Show a lot. These like the I would put very much more in sounds, sort of like um, um, ambient, sort of like eighties, um, like uh, kind of pop in the, new in the, wave like, mixing stage, uh, we'll add area. Certain but I really like responded uh, make to it these sound like two this songs. Danny is also a highly sought after drummer. She has played some incredible venues around Canada, including the Scotia Bank um, Arena. Uh, that will just Hall. add that, like a, a, a percussion uh, moment that, like Bonnie Juno Ray Award used nominations. Used She's played with a song artists in the 70s such as that July really Talk, like that kind Sarah of stuff. Harmer, That's uh, what Fifi really Thompson. makes the music. Uh, and I got the um, opportunity uh, to chat with her and sound to, to speak to someone who not only like what is I, an accomplished like, songwriter in their own right, my own sound, but is a in demand. No, uh, I professional can absolutely see drummer that there's just certain who sort of hired to work tones with artists to who are instruments at the on top certain of their music field that you just right now. So that your ear is something I was very uh, like a, ex- excited a to learn more about, love, um, and including uh, and talking might about be more songwriting about a production process choice, but that very sort of two new songs, uh, crisp snare drum, she, are to me, out that's now a very everywhere you get your music. Eighties, so like if you enjoy this conversation, you should go and check out those songs as well. Dry like and thank you again so much for being here. Let's talk to that to me really like propels the group groove of mm-hmm. two very groovy tracks ordinary love and, and anything at all mm-hmm. yeah i mean that's i'm as a as like being a drummer is 
being my is my first instrument so and my main instrument so i i really think it's important to um focus on the drums and make sure that you're recording on a bed track that has really really good sounding drums because to me that that makes me want to listen to a song so i find that to be like the most important part no absolutely because in at at a certain point like primarily i think a lot of your music because i i went back and listened to a lot of a lot of the music i like uh all comes back to like a groove or something that you can physically move move to i i have this like overarching theory about like tracing all like modern music can be traced back to like when we were like Kate Niagara Falls dancing around fire or or what have you. So it's like sure. a very all that sort of like community ritual sort of stuff. I feel like drum is the centerpiece of of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So with drums being your your first instrument, I'm curious how you approach uh like using them in the songwriting process because I the drums are the one thing that I can't even fake that I I understand how to play. So I'm mm-hmm. curious, because as like a guitarist, I know like you could put together chords or maybe you have a, a melody in your head. So I'm curious, like, do you ever like lead with drums when it comes to songwriting? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that for the most part, um, that would be the first thing I think about is like how to what if I'm feeling something um, and I'm trying to get like a, an emotion out. The first thing I think about is what tempo is it and how how strong does it sound? How quiet does it sound? How like, uh, how do the drum, how can the drums give off the energy that I'm trying to get out? Um, Mm -hmm. So I think about that first. And I also think that as like, because I'm a drummer for other artists, I feel like I, I play in a way and also a songwriter. I feel like I play the drums in a way that, um, I play to the lyrics a little bit. Like if there's a little line that kind of does something unique, then I'll try to do that with it. It's hard to explain, but I'm just playing to the, to the lyrics and to the song rather than just playing to the bass, let's say. Right. Like something this say the vocalist is saying like a lyric or an emotion, the drum is maybe like backing up that feeling like so the drum part if the if the lyric is maybe if it's particularly like uh like powerful or impactful maybe the drum hits a little harder or has like a little certain flair to it that it might not mm-hmm. if maybe it was a more quiet or or like sad lyric yeah and i think also the what i tried to do for ordinary love was because it feels like a little bit of a emotional song it feels a little bit heavy like dark at times I didn't want to I didn't want the drums to be quiet I wanted them to be like big fills like Phil Collins type fills because I just think that yeah. he kind of does that too where he's like being pretty serious but he's also just like playing these crazy big drums I like the way that, that oh, sounds yeah. yeah he he in particular well, not only like the most legendary drum fill, I think of like the last 50 years mm-hmm. uh, in in the air tonight. But similarly, like his drums always have that like they're they're always kind of like echoey. Like I feel like they're always like very big, maybe with like a lot of reverb or reverb on them. But again, yeah. similarly, like to to what I, I heard listening to your your two new songs it has that very like sort of like pop to it that's sort of like very like crisp uh i don't know not overly compressed just enough kind of kind of just sort of sort of like it just comes in like bam right when you need especially like in the in the chorus and you have this like beautifully like wistful vocal uh melody cutting cutting through the chorus like it the that groove really just lifts elevates what you're singing awesome that's great um, so what I'm also cu- uh, curious about, so if drums are your first instrument, um, when you started playing or maybe like when you when you, your mind started forming around, like maybe I'm going to play music also, did you have like a North star for, uh, either a band or a drummer? Was there something that pulled you, uh, to, th- to the kit? Um, 
I don't think necessarily I I mean my my mom's a musician and when I was growing up she had a band and she still has a band um but I remember watching her play watching her band play and then like helping the drummer pack up the drums and always being like wanting to sit behind the kid and play but at the time I didn't have any like you know female drummer and you know people to look up to I didn't didn't even think about the fact that it's unusual or not as uh it's just you don't see a lot of like female drummers at that time when I was young so I don't Mm -hmm. it's funny how like I don't even realize that it was something I could do I just wanted to and I didn't think anyone would say that's different or anyone would say like oh that's unusual or you know, why don't you sing or why don't you do this? And no one really did, but it's still, I didn't look up to anyone. To be honest, I I was just like, you know, this is the type of music I like. Um, You know, I was really into Madonna. I was a huge Madonna fan. Um, But she wasn't a drummer. So I just, (laughs) yeah, I didn't have anyone. There's just something about seeing like the drummer in your your mom's band that was just sort of sounds like there was something that was kind of uh, compelling in that in that moment though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I wanted to be the drummer. I wanted to like set them up and like I loved the way that it felt when I played the drums. It felt great. I just and I still feel that way. I mean, it's my sometimes when I have a show where it's me playing guitar and singing it, it's I love it just the same but in a different way um the drums somehow make me feel um the best but I, mm-hmm. I don't think I had any like oh you know what actually I think when I started um playing drums more frequently I really was into Levon Helm I don't know if you know Levon Helm no who's that the drummer from the band Oh, yes. I, I do know yeah. the band, of course. Yeah. So that was, I would say, like my, the type of drummer that I really wanted to emulate. Um, but I didn't get into that till I was like early 20s or so. Um, so, so Levi from the band, he's the kind of drummer you wanted to be. Yeah. Um, Levon, Levon Helm. Oh, Levon. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. He, I loved his style and he was the most inspirational drummer to me because I felt like it was something that I could play. And I loved his, I loved his playing. And he was the first drummer where I realized that like, this was something I could do. Yeah. That that's because there's just something about like those, those songs that again, like I keep coming back to, to groove, but there's just something so like, it just infects it, it enters you and like it's just sort of like a feeling that is very difficult to describe but it's if you know you know you know like mm-hmm. kind of a feeling yeah very cool and 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 madonna i think i because i i became aware of madonna like i think to uh very late compared to most people like i came in around like music like the early 2000s oh, okay so yeah. So her, like, I had to go back and learn about, like, what a cultural force she was, especially with, like, certain, uh, with her, like, like, like a virgin music video and all the stuff with Pepsi and the, the coffee table book. But I, I'm imagining there's a certain kind of, like, chariz- there's a charisma that she has in, like, a style that is hard to ignore, like, when you're, when you're a younger music fan. Mm-hmm. De- definitely. I just... uh and I think in my high school, I was like the only one who, who liked Madonna. Everyone else was listening to like, you know, the Spice Girls and stuff, which I, I also was listening to. Um, but I also like had a lot of um, interest in older music as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found that Madonna was so captivating and... Uh, her songs are so catchy and like, I'm not sure who's writing them or if she's collaborating with other people. I know that she writes, she writes a lot of it, but 
I think she has a lot of help, and I loved that those beats. Oh, absolutely! Like just the eighties were such like that era. There was just so much great like like drum beats playing, and so much uh like great uh great hooks just left and right. Yeah. I loved uh yeah that the era. drums in the eighties are really really good. <laughs> to, to, totally. Um, and did you grow up in Toronto or uh, did you grow up somewhere else? Um, I was born in Ajax and I grew up in Ajax. Ajax um, and then I moved to Toronto when I was about 18. Okay. And is uh, Ajax a big city, small city? Um, it's, it's like kind of big now. But it's only, it's like sort of outside of Toronto. It's like a suburb outside of Toronto. Gotcha. Okay. So like that move would be like, I'm going to move to the big city kind of move. Yes, exactly. You're from New York? Yes. That's, uh, I, I grew up in Maryland, like really rural, but I've been in New York for the past uh, 14 years. Okay. Cool. So similarly, I was like, uh, I basically, I found out recently that the house I grew up in for most of my high school years is was a converted cottage, not really like a house that most people would think <laughs> of when they think of a house. Yeah. And, and didn't have internet for a long time. Um, my mom's house still doesn't have internet. So there's this whole chunk of pop culture that I've, I missed out on, but I had to like go and find uh, like bits and pieces in like guitar magazines uh, when I was in high school. Right. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. So, so going from uh, a Ajax to uh, Toronto, I'm curious. So, if that was around when you were 18, um, were you like the the kind? Were you like going to? Did you start going to a lot of shows and locally when you were uh, a teenager in Toronto? Um, definitely. Yeah, maybe when I was about 17. Um, I actually had a band in high school. And that's when I started playing the drums. And that's when I started playing, uh, like going to other shows and taking an interest in seeing other live bands. Cause I wanted to make my band like better than everyone. So I had to go and see how people were doing it. Uh -huh. Um, and mostly like local stuff, but then I started going to like bigger concerts. And, yeah. Cool. And what was your high school band like? My high school band, we, uh, it was a cover band and we played like No Doubt covers and, uh, who nice. else did we play? Yeah, we did like a Rolling Stones cover, I think. It was just very like garage band. But I remember, um, we did a Battle of the Bands it, in Oshawa, which is like kind of a small town outside of Ajax or outside of Toronto. And we won the Battle of the Bands. And that was a huge deal <laughs> at that time. Nice. <laughs> yeah, felt like a huge deal. So when you were starting to play, where, what kind of places were you playing? Was, there, was it mostly like bars and clubs? Were like people putting on shows in like houses or like rec centers? Right. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, <laughs> there wasn't a ton of venues in Ajax especially. Um, the Battle of the Bands was actually in a basement and it was all ages and I don't think there was a bar. I think it was just like someone's D DIY space that they just put uh -huh. on. Um, yeah, the other place I went to was this warehouse in Ajax, like behind the beer store. And there was just like these punk bands playing and it was all like kids. and. Yeah, I also I don't think there was a bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny. Oh yeah, well because at that age you're just about like seeing and do, and doing something. So I I didn't learn to drink until much much later when I was uh Yeah, like adult. it wasn't about I it was just about like wearing something cool and like going to hang out with your friends and it was either do that or like go to the community center and go to the pool, you know, those were like <laughs> the two options on a Friday night. Oh, totally. Yeah. You just wanted to like 
look cool in front of like your friends that you're used to just spending English class with. And then you want to see them in yeah. like a non-school setting and be like, oh, okay. So you're a, you're a cool person also. Yeah, exactly. Um, so how long were you in, in this, uh, this band that you did the battle of bands with? Oh gosh, maybe like half of a, half of a year. Uh huh. Um, yeah, I think. And then I like graduated high school and like, I just left. I just started like doing my own thing. And what did that look like? The reason I ask is because you have an extensive like list of, of people that you've, you've played with. So I'm curious, did you become like a like musician, like running, running gun right away? Or did you like initially set out to do like solo albums and your own stuff? Yeah. Um, well, when I started meeting musicians in Toronto and I started going to shows and I knew that, you know, I, I wanted to drum and I, cause I already had drummed, but it had been a few years at that point. Um, mm -hmm. cause I was in, I went to, um, OCAD for, which is an art school in Toronto. And so I wasn't really playing music. And then I met these musicians and I was like, I played the drums. Um, and they had a weekly gig at this bar, uh, where I live, um, like downstairs from my house. Um, so I would go there every week and I'd play the drums and then I just started to do it more and more and more. And it's been like 15 years almost of me, um, just word of mouth, getting gigs and touring and yeah. And now I'm just touring all the time. And that's my main job is that is my job. It's my only job <laughs> is playing music. So it took a long time, but it was like a slow process of just who, you know, and your name getting in people's minds and yeah that's really really cool danny i l love to to hear that that's like the the dream uh for so many of my my peers to just have that be the the job that's really cool yeah. who was the f who was the the first uh like big artist you went on the road with um I would say, well, my first band that went on the road was called The Sure Things. It was a mm -hmm. country band. Um, and then there was this artist, Samantha Martin, who I went on the road with. And then from there, um, July Talk. I don't know if you know band July Talk. I, I did check them out a little bit. I okay. enjoyed what I heard. Similar kind of like talking heads kind of, kind of new wave is what it made me think of. Yeah, totally. Um, and then from there, it was like Fifi Dobson and then Sarah Harmer. And uh, I sort of have a bit of a rotating schedule of people that I re regularly play with that hire me. Um, so those are those are some of those people. And I've been playing That's... with them for like at least six, six or seven years now. That's That's amazing. Just like... Um, have you toured internationally with these folks or mostly in, in Canada? Uh, yep. In the States and in Europe. That's, that's amazing. I have, uh, so many questions for, uh, to, about this, this process. Cause this, this really fascinates me. So when you get like hi I, hired or if there's like an audition process to work with an artist, and you have to learn a set list real and you have to learn a set list really quickly. Are you always familiar with have you always been familiar with who you're about to work with? Or have you had to learn a set like really, really fast? I definitely have. And that's stressful. But I find I luck like lately I've been playing with artists that I admire and people that I music that I listen to. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's it's not as difficult. Um, but there are times when I given a set list of like 15 songs and I have to learn them all somehow, but I have this, I have a system for it where if I showed you my, I don't have one on me, but if I showed you my, my like writing, my charting for learning songs, you wouldn't understand any of it. It looks crazy. 
but I've developed uh-huh. a system over the years of how to like get music into my brain. And then when it's time to learn something else, I have to like find somewhere to put it so that I can like go back there in my, in my brain and pull it back to the front when I need to use it next. <laughs> right. Cause if it's a couple tours and then you have to go back in and, and re remember what you, what you did. I've seen exactly. a couple of things from like working musicians that they don't use the typical, like, okay, I'm going to memorize what the verse is. They, I'm going to memorize what the, the chorus is. There seems to be like varying, uh, varying systems. Uh, so it sounds like mm-hmm. you have kind of like a somewhat bespoke kind of methodology for like, okay, I, I'm going to do this part. This part is this for, for this many measures. And then it's this for this many measures. Yeah. I have like, a, I'll use like a square. I'll write like verse one and then I'll have a square beside the end of the verse. And that means like stop. And mm-hmm. then I'll put arrows. If, and that means like keep playing or like fill or like, you know, I'll just, yeah, it's a bit wacky. But it makes sense to me. So, so. <laughs> well, that that's the only person needs to to make sense to us, so that you can go on stage and and entertain and and play at the the right spots. I imagine. So you don't just like people don't just like hand you sheet music and go memorize this. No, like, no, I've never I've never been trained so I, um perfect like at that level. So I I don't mm-hmm. know how to read music. Oh, n- neither neither do I. <laughs> all of my favorite musicians would n- don't know how to to like read or write or write for music. sure same same here yeah <laughs> yeah and it drives my like cla- like i have friends who are like classically trained and they're just like ah how, what are you doing and i'm like having enjoying myself <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so okay so you got let me okay so let me ask you this because i was also reading on your your website a little bit so it sounds like you've also played like i imagine like some rock clubs and then you also play like big arenas what's like the mental shift that goes from playing like out of maybe like a 500 cap venue to suddenly you're on in like the same arena where like the white caps play right yeah um it's it's interesting i feel like if you're at it, if you're playing an arena and there's 15,000 people there, um, playing to like 300 people is scarier because once you get to like 10,000, even like 5,000 people, it just becomes one person. It's almost like there's too many people that I don't even have to look at anybody. Like I don't have to make eye contact with anyone. I can't see anybody. It's, pitch black out there um but if there's like 300 people then i'm like i look out and people are looking at me and i can see them looking at me so i almost prefer the arenas like it doesn't make me nervous it makes me like feel better interesting Mm -hmm. that kind of that that makes sense that makes sense to me um because there's it's it becomes the crowd becomes like a monolith and there's less i would even argue there's less chance to like catch someone up 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 front and like focus on their individual yeah. reaction yeah uh, it's like I've, it's I've like there, there's so yeah it's like there's so many people that it just becomes like one orb of people whereas when there's 300 everyone's an individual because you can see what they look like and you can see how they're reacting to what you're doing. Yes. Uh, yeah. So many of my comedian friends will be having, uh, doing a show and having, doing really well. Like a lot of people are laughing, but then there's like maybe one person who, for whatever reason, might not even necessarily have anything to do with them, who's like not having like the best time or not responding the way everyone else is. And then that's all you can think about the next day. Exactly. Like, what, what was going? What was going on there? <laughs> yeah. Um, is there a particular uh, city that you've toured to that you really remember fondly in terms of just getting to a chance to see it? Um, actually, recently, 
I just did a tour of the East Coast and I went down to, I mean, I've been to New York a million times and it is my number one favorite city, but I went to Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh is very cool. It's mm -hmm. my new favorite place. <laughs> yeah. No, Pittsburgh has a great music scene and this really cool uh, punk rock festival happens every year in Pittsburgh called the Four Chord Music Festival. So Okay. Pittsburgh has a, a lot going on, I have uh, learned recently. And similarly, mm -hmm. like, like, you know, kind of working class kind of city that probably that is not been given their fair shake. So I feel like there's some realness uh, to the, the good yes. people of, of Pittsburgh. Yeah. And what's another city? I'm, uh, I, another place I really want to play. I don't know if you've ever played here, but I've been hearing co good things about Richmond, Virginia lately. Oh, yeah, I played there um in the fall. That oh, was yeah? really Yeah, it was really we played the um country country music museum. Um and it was it was great. I loved it. Oh, nice. That's that's awesome. So you, so you've played a lot of a lot of country music. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this I'm I'm intrigued by. I don't know how much uh, of this you might be able to answer, but I'm I'm getting the impression that Canada has this like scene of like pop country that is uh, that is rather popular. And from an outside perspective, I I don't know how how that's happening. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I think that the west coast of Canada, um, especially Alberta is basically Texas. And <laughs> yep. I, I think, I think that country artists really do really well, especially pop country artists do really well in the West, you know, middle to West coast of Canada, because um, people just like the stampede, the Calgary stampede happens every year. It's all like um, cowboys and stuff. And yeah, it's like Texas. <laughs> no, like especially out near Cal uh, Calgary, just like real cowboys uh, are still yeah. out there. <laughs> yes, real, real cowboys. Yeah, that's 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 wild. I've my I haven't spent a ton of time in that in that part of of Canada. My w wife has for for work. I've I've been fortunate enough to mostly be in Vancouver or Montreal or Ottawa right. on on a, on occasion. So, uh, but I. Something is going to bring me to to Calgary sooner sooner or later. <laughs> I can yeah. I can feel it. <laughs> um, and how about like uh like your your European cities? Have you where do you usually uh go when mm -hmm. you play there? Um, a lot of places in Germany. Um, Hamburg, Berlin. Um, um, gosh, get some of the names I can't even remember. Oh, um. I played in the, the Netherlands, a place called Utrecht. I don't know if you've heard of Utrecht. Uh -huh. That's no. a great spot. Um, played in Switzerland. Um, Paris. I love Paris, obviously. Great. And oh, I, yeah. love the, I love London, too. Um, yeah, I would say a lot of Germany. I play this, so I played this festival called... Um, Oh my god, Reaper Bond! Oh, I have heard, heard of Reaper this. Bond. Mm -hmm. I have, yeah. That's a really, really fun, fun uh, festival to play. Awesome, and so, so as you've get have gotten uh, get known as a drummer and are and start touring the world, and this becomes your 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 really cool day job, essentially. Um, were you still writing stuff? your own songs for solo work or when, when did the, when did you have the idea that like, I need to release some music of my own? Um, yeah, I've always kind of been doing both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think that after my first band sort of disbanded, we, um, I felt like it was the right time for me to put out some music. Um, mm -hmm. so I put out an album, I would say maybe that was 2000. 15 maybe uh -huh. um or maybe 13 
and then uh sorry <laughs> the dog in the um oh no no worries uh, he's very cute <laughs> um and then i sort of put that, that to bed for a little while because i started drumming a lot more and then mm-hmm. i put out an album over the pandemic because that seemed like the right time something for oh, me yeah. to do yeah and then i released those two songs uh ordinary love and anything at all um about a week ago less than a week ago yeah and there and those are the songs that kind of really like drew me to you. Although I did listen to uh, your, uh, your self, your self titled and very similarly, I, I enjoyed the kind of, uh, again, like super, super heavy on, on hooks. I, I think my favorite one, maybe just for the, the title is the, the final track, get a dog. Maybe that's just cause I'm, I'm thinking oh, yeah. of it right now, but that <laughs> I like that. I like that sentiment, uh, uh, quite a bit. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so these, uh, so these two singles are these uh, maybe in a, ahead of another full length, or are these uh, one one offs? These two songs. Um, they're they're one offs. Um, but it's sort of a bit of a gateway, maybe to the next um next album that I'll make. Um, sort of like an in between figuring out what kind of sound I want and I want and sort of uh, exploring different types of songwriting. Mm -hmm. I think it's just like something to, you know, I wrote these songs a while ago and I just want to like get them out so I can start on the new, the new stuff. No, absolutely. Um, There's a a certain sense of like, I want to, put these to bed, let, like, let them go, let them free. And then I can almost like when you get a new notebook and it's time to, to start writing in it. Yeah, exactly. Very, very cool. Um, I'd love to also ask you, ask you, um, just, and then I'll, I'll, uh, as we, we come in for a landing here, cause I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I feel like I've, I've, I'm learning a lot, especially around like oh, respecting great. my drummer, my drummer and more. In the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but when, like when it comes to songwriting, so you drums are your first instrument and then you, and then you sing as well. Did I hear you say you play, you play guitar as well? Uh, yeah, that's sort of, um, how I do some, some of my songwriting is with guitar. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to to lyric writing, what usually, what have you found really helps works uh, best f- for you? Does the a chorus usually come first, or is it usually is it words and then you match music to it? Um, it's actually the other way around. It's usually music and then I match words to it. I feel like a lot of the time the lyrics for me be not that they're secondary, but they they come second um and then when the song sort of when i know what the sound is and what it's gonna feel like then i know what i'm supposed to be writing about if that makes sense i it does similarly how like a film score can give you like a certain emotion or or put certain words in your head sometimes for me there's Mm -hmm. the 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 mood of a, a piece of music that makes you think of certain things. And then that kind of inspires what you might start writing words about that. I've, I've had that That's for right. sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Have you, and have you done gigs uh, as a solo artist? Like when you're not on the road as a drummer? Yeah. I used to do them uh, often. Um, past few years, I've been really busy. I haven't had a ton of time to focus on that, but, um, sure. I've done a few and I do hope that I can do some more, uh, in the future. Is there a city you would like to go to that you haven't been to yet? Um, hmm. That's funny. I never think about that. <laughs> I always just in my head, I always think I'm just going to go there. So I never think, I never think like, if I could, where would I go? I just usually just end up there. (laughs) Right. (laughs) 
Huh. Um. Okay, I, I will say I've been to Austin once for like a very, very brief time. Mm-hmm. It might have been it might have been hours. And uh I'd say it was maybe ten hours. But I really, really loved I would love to go back there. Um and see because I hear the music scene there is really cool. You you said Austin as in Texas? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Austin's really, really cool city. I've been uh it's been a while since I've been there, but I I loved it there. Like literally you could just walk in anywhere and and there's a stage. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's what I hear. Yeah. Yeah. It's changed a little bit in the last few years with the infiltration of like uh like tech and and such, but it's still it's still got that bit of weirdness that makes it cool. Awesome. Did you ever see uh the Richard Linklater movie Slacker? Um, I don't think so. That's a, a really great like movie set in like Austin, Texas, just f- goes from like character to character to character over the course of a day. It's very much a like a time capsule of the city at the time. Oh, that's if you're awesome. into if you want to get like a glimpse into the Austin of your, that's a, a great movie to, to check okay. out. Okay. I'd love to watch that. <laughs> awesome. Uh one more thing I'd I'd love to to ask you. Um just more of a, a practical thing. If uh, cause I imagine you've toured at different level at varying levels. I imagine you've done van, maybe you've done, I don't know if you've done like tour bus or like small RV kind of. Uh, yeah, touring. I've done. Yeah. Done tour. Yeah. I'll, I'll have done it all. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there's something that if you saw like a young band just about to go on the road for the first time, if there's something you could just like grab them by the, the shirt collar and make sure they don't forget, what would that thing be? Save your receipts. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> Save your receipts so that you can write everything off so that you don't have to pay a bunch of money. <laughs> Fantastic. That is so that is so useful. And I bet so and I bet so few fans do, especially all those ga- gas receipts. And claim yeah. that. Claim yep. that at the end of the day. Amazing. Um, yeah. Well, Danny, I've really in, enjoyed uh, this time. So I would love to, I want to make sure people can can find you. So uh, your new single, um, which is two songs, Ordinary Love and Anything at All, is out now. Where can people go if they want to find out more? Um, on Spotify, there's an album that I put out a few years ago that you can listen to. Um, you can go on Bandcamp and you can buy merch. Um, you can go on my Instagram, Danny Nash Music. Uh, there's videos on YouTube you can watch. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And thank you again for, for chatting with me. I really enjoyed those two songs. So it was really nice to get to, to spend some time and, and talk shop with you. Thank you again for doing the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Okay, folks, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, Danny Nash's new single, Ordinary Love and Anything at All, is available everywhere you get your music. And if you want to check out more, you can go to dannynash.com or Danny Nash Music on Instagram. And thank you all for, uh, so much for being here. That is our show for today. If you enjoyed this podcast and think you know a friend who would be interested in it as well, you can send them to awesomedisaster.com that has links to everything related to the show. If you want to give us a follow and a rating or review on your podcast platform of choice, be it Apple, Spotify, Pan- or Pandora or Amazon Music, you can uh, do so and that will help us please uh, the almighty algorithm because that is uh, what creatives uh, have to deal with nowadays is the whims of a computer uh, to expose our stuff to cool people that are into it as well. And uh, you can follow me on Instagram, willcarry23 or uh, at comicwillcarry on TikTok. And if you want to go a little bit further and support the show, you can go uh, and check out our Patreon as well as our merch store. Both of links are available 
at awesomedisaster.com. And if you, like me, have a big project that you are uh, trying to get done that is moving slowly, I wish you uh, some excellent progress in the very near future. So thank you all again so much for being here. And I will see you next time between Awesome and Disaster. Take care, everybody. <laughs>